When someone asks me what my favorite horror games are, I tend to steer them towards either the classic Resident Evil Raccoon City series or the first few entries of Silent Hill. Both of these games are incredibly important for the horror survival genre, and even to this day, I can pick up the originals and still enjoy them incredibly much during these times when the nights are still long and we're a bit away from spring. Resident Evil has had numerous entries and remakes, and even Silent Hill 2 is getting a remake soon, which I'm incredibly excited for to see whether it's going to live up to the original or not. But sometimes, there's this game. This game that you played in your childhood, that you just cannot get out of your head. You don't know the title anymore, but when you see someone play it, you just know that this or something like it is what you played all those years ago. A while back when I was working on the Ocarina of Time video, I encountered a Twitch stream of somebody playing Fatal Frame Maiden of Blackwater. Before I knew it, memories came rushing back of my early teenage self hiding under the covers in my room as I played a game that was almost exactly the same as the game that I'd been watching the streamer play. I remember vividly that it scared the pants off of me. The atmosphere being one of dread, isolation, as if you're under the constant watchful eye of something that is out to get you. Not trying to kill you outright, but toying with you. Trying to get you as scared as possible before inevitably striking at you. While at the same time, there is nobody around that would be able to get you out of this situation. The game would make you feel truly alone as you made your way through a dark and foreboding mansion without a friend in sight. Just us and our trusty camera to make it through the game. Hey buddy, I'm the dadliest man in town. And today, as I was doing my dad things like figuring out how the heck my new camera works, I started thinking about a game from my teenage years. This is Fatal Frame. In this video, we'll be going back to the early 2000s to look at gameplay, development, plot, and anything else we can think of regarding Fatal Frame and at the end, just like before, I'll give my opinion on the game. Hopefully by then, you'll have formed your own opinion as well. A quick word regarding the gameplay footage, I played it on an emulator. I contemplated capturing the game from my good old PS3 initially, since I had the original one that still played PS2 games, but unfortunately the golden oldie decided to yellow light on me after I hooked it up after all these years. Still, we're not going to let that spoil the fun. We'll be diving into the game's plot deeply in this one, so just to make sure if you're still intending to play this game fresh without having any knowledge, spoiler warning ahead for Fatal Frame 1. A cult hit, but a possibly somewhat underappreciated series when it comes to the aspect of horror in video games, Fatal Frame was the brainchild of Makoto Shibata a game director and scenario writer from Japan who based the story off of his personal spiritual experiences. Together with producer Keisuke Kikuchi, Shibata set out to create the scariest game possible. Development on Fatal Frame began in earnest when the PlayStation 2 hardware was first introduced to Tecmo. Under the codename Project Zero, the game would be developed. One of the things the developers got their inspiration from was the positive reception of the way characters were depicted in the Silent Hill series. Using this as a sort of stepping stone and a target for them to take their game a step further in an attempt to create the idea of sensing things off screen, the ultimate goal was to create as frightening an atmosphere as possible. According to character designer and CGI director Hitoshi Hasegawa, the game's key colors are black and white. White represented hope, while black represented fear. During early development, a large amount of effort went into adjusting the lighting and shading with the in-game representation of the aforementioned key colors and their effect being Miku's flashlight piercing through the darkness inside the mansion. Initially, the camera obscura, the player's main defense against the spirits, was not in the game, and the idea was to drive them off using nothing but the flashlight. Think Luigi's Mansion, but then without the Poltergust 3000. Inclusion of the camera obscura was a source of discussion between Shibata and Kikuchi, but the further the development went, the better Kikuchi understood the inclusion of the item. 
In addition to black and white representing hope and fear, a third key color represented through Miku's clothing was red, representing life as the antithesis to the spirits that depict death. For inspiration on creating the proper mood of the game, the team watched both high and low budget Japanese horror films and used this information to create a truly chilling atmosphere. Initially, the idea for the story was to be set in the present day, keeping in mind that the present day meant 2001, of course. The choice, however, was made to change the setting to 1986, taking away the players and specifically the characters' access to modern technology such as mobile phones to evoke a sense of isolation and loneliness, as there would be no way to reach the outside world as soon as the player entered Himuro Mansion. Sound was also a very important aspect in creating a sense of dread for the player to experience while playing the game. The composer and sound director was Shigekio Okuda, who during the concept development was set on using stereo sounds to reinforce the atmosphere. Making the sounds available in stereo allowed the player to in essence sense where ghosts were coming from, filling the rooms up with moans and wailing coming towards you from both left and right. And let me tell you, closing your eyes while playing this game, even in 2023, was enough to fill me with a sense of anxiety. The sound usage in the game is absolutely on point, as we'll see further on in the review when we get to the actual game. We start off the game playing as a character called Mafuyu, in search of Junsei Takamine, a novelist who was doing research into forbidden rituals that were being done in this area of Japan. Takamine has apparently gone missing during his investigation, and Mafuyu took it upon himself to search for him. The section of the game will serve as our tutorial, as there is no immediate threat or danger to attack us just yet. We'll explore the mansion, making ourselves familiar with the controls. This seems like a good time to talk about all the kinds of ghosts we will be encountering in the game. Roughly, they can be classified into three types. Hidden ghosts, non-violent ghosts, and aggressive ghosts. Hidden ghosts can be identified by the filament turning blue in the right-hand corner. The filament will serve as our most visible optical clue that something is near us. We might also hear static immediately setting me off because of years of conditioning thanks to playing Silent Hill. Or we might see a sort of distortion in the air. The best way to find these ghosts is to follow all of the above signs. When they are all at their strongest, chances are we're standing right next to the hidden ghost. When we have one or all of the signs, we'll go into camera mode and scan our environment. When the capture circle turns blue, it means the ghost is in our sights. A subtype of the hidden ghosts are the seal ghosts. Now, the seal ghosts are going to be important, as without them, progressing through the mansion is almost impossible. Once we see them, we take a picture, and a door somewhere in the mansion will become unsealed. We'll now move on to non-violent ghosts. These are ghosts that we can sense by the filament turning orange. These ghosts will not attack us, but they will disappear after a certain amount of time. We'll need to capture them quickly in order to add them to our ghost list. They serve a dual purpose, both to guide us to our next objective, but also to reward us with spirit points. We'll get into spirit points later on, but let's just say that capturing as many ghosts as possible will be beneficial to us in the long run. We'll mainly deal with hidden ghosts and non-violent ghosts initially in the section where we play as Mafuyu, so I'll leave it to that for now until it changes. We move further into the mansion, snapping pictures of ghosts left and right. While we're making our way through it, I'd like to touch on the fact of the soundtrack. Generally, the game is either silent or filled with an ambient sound that I can only explain as moaning or wailing people in the background. It's very off-putting and it does an excellent job of putting me into an anxious state of mind. The wailing gives me the feeling of constantly being surrounded by a presence that I can't see. And considering that the presences are ghosts, they can strike at any time they want. From a horror perspective, it works. 
The lack of a battle theme accentuates that the player is technically in a constant danger, even though the actual combat sections of the game are heavily scripted. We'll make our way up some stairs and eventually find a book which will trigger Mafuyu to have a flashback of Takamine and his team consisting of himself, his editor Koji Ogata, and assistant Tomoe Hirasaka. Walking through the hallway, we pass through ourselves earlier. Spectral hands come out of the darkness. Takamine turns around as if he senses something, but the hands disappear. However, when he does turn around, the spectral form of a woman in a white kimono is behind him. Mafuyu takes this vision as proof that Takamine came by, but he's suddenly shaken by a sense of danger. He takes the camera and looks through it, shocked when the face of a ghost suddenly appears out of nowhere. Mafuyu snaps a picture of the ghost, making it reel back. This will be the last type of ghost, the aggressive ghosts that I mentioned earlier. These sections are where the pressure is pushed to full holding your breath level. At least, for me it was. We'll have to pull up the camera obscura and aim through it at the ghost, putting us in a first person perspective. When we have it in our sights, the circle inside the camera will turn blue. The longer we keep the camera focused on our enemy, the more damage we will do to it. We could just take a few shots of the ghost to finish it off, capturing its spirit. However, the game has a bit of a risk-reward system during these combat phases. If we manage to stay focused on the ghost long enough to where the blue circle turns orange, we'll have a split second to take the picture and get a so-called zero shot. Zero shots will do a lot of damage to the ghosts, and I highly recommend waiting out the battles to take these as much as possible considering film for the camera can be scarce at times if you're not looking through the mansion and are just in a blind panic to progress as quickly as I was. We finish off the ghost, since this is the tutorial part of the game and mostly meant to familiarize ourselves with the controls, about two shots should be enough to take care of it. We move on and I have yet another heart attack when a ghost moves into a doorway, signaling where we need to go. We'll head down the stairs and follow after it, noting that the door the ghost went into was closed just a little while ago. We return to the hallway and a cutscene starts before we're introduced to the real main character of the game. We're now playing as Miku Hinasaki, Mafuyu's sister, who's traveled to Himuro Mansion to find her brother, who apparently went missing after the section we just played. As we'll find out, Mafuyu's bit of gameplay took place two weeks before the present day. Miku enters the mansion and is immediately creeped out by the girl in the white kimono standing behind her. She looks somewhat different from the quick glimpses we caught earlier. Younger and dare I say, somewhat less menacing. She also doesn't kill us outright, and throughout the game, we'll encounter her more often. From here, 
we'll mostly retrace Mafu's steps as we make our way through the mansion itself. From the moment we open our first door, we're noticed by a ghost standing near a screen. We'll head into the next room and find our way in the hallway where we last left Mafu. His camera is lying on the ground, and as soon as we touch it, we get a vision of Mafu running through a hallway, hands reaching out to him from the walls as he's being chased by the girl in the kimono. As Miku contemplates what happened to him, we look up and see the girl hovering behind us in the mirror. After the scene, we've gained both the camera obscura and Mafuyu's notebook, giving us some more exposition about what went on in Himuro Mansion and why it was so interesting for Takamine to take a whole team inside the building. This is a good time to mention that just like Alone in the Dark, a lot of the game's backstory will be found in items that are scattered throughout the mansion. It's a bit of a staple in the survival horror genre, but the addition of having actual cutscenes alongside the findable and also missable items really heightens the storytelling from a narrative perspective. In the same room, we'll have the ability to use the camera and look up, finding a man on a beam. We'll take a picture of him and he'll mention something about ropes before we continue on. We'll now go into the mansion proper, picking up items like medicine as we take pictures of ghosts in each of the rooms we go through. I feel now is a good time to talk about spirit points, considering we're somewhat past the tutorial point in the game. The camera obscura, basically the only weapon we have, has an upgrade system which uses spirit points as currency to buy the upgrades. Taking pictures of the hidden ghosts and the guiding ghosts will reward us with spirit points, which will help us upgrade the camera for our encounters with the aggressive ghosts. There is the possibility to run through the game while ignoring most of the hidden ghosts if we don't want to take pictures of them, but doing so will ultimately hurt us in the long run as it'll leave us underpowered during the later parts of the game. As we move through the mansion, we'll find a newspaper clipping, stating that a human body with no limbs was found in the Himuro Mountains, the body's hands, feet, and head being separated from the torso. The police are apparently investigating the case, as apparently a murder happened years ago with the body left in exactly the same state. In the same room as the newspaper clipping, we'll find a closed cabinet with a strange garbled sound emanating from it. Obviously, the best thing to do when you hear a strange sound being emitted from a cabinet in a haunted mansion is to open it and see what the heck is going on. That just scared the ever-living crap out of me. When we grab the recorder, we'll be treated to a cutscene of Ogata trying to hide in the closet from the girl in the kimono. Unfortunately for him, she's very good at hide and seek, and she catches him. Now that we have the tape recorder, we also gain the white tape, which will give us more insight on Takamine's journey throughout Himuro Mansion. We'll encounter a few more of these tapes along the way, so the recorder is definitely going to come in handy. In one of the rooms, someone calls out to us. We turn around but see nothing until we're eventually shaken by a sound. We turn a corner and are met with the ghost of Ogata, begging us to help him. He'll shamble towards us and we'll use the camera obscura to finish him off. He's technically a full-on fight, but the game is extremely fair in the fact that we're still learning the ropes, pun intended 
and doesn't make this an extremely hard fight. Once we defeat Ogata, it'll break the seal on the camera, allowing us to use the bonus functions on it. We'll need something called Spirit Stones to use them, however. Defeating him awards us with the White Tape 2, a continuation of the first one so we can get more insight on what the heck happened to Takamine's team. September 9th, 9.40 p.m. It seemed dangerous to walk through the mountain at night, so we decided to spend the night here and continue our work. I've been through several rooms already. Unlike the exterior, the interior is still in quite good shape. A little earlier, I thought I saw a white, shadowy figure of a woman in the hallway near the entrance. I'll keep track of such sightings and publish them in a later account. The game has now effectively done what it can to train us in how to use the camera, and it's just about time for the gloves to come off. Once we open one of the doors, Ogata's ghost will show up once again and shamble towards us. Apparently, Ogata didn't take the hint the first time. We'll head towards the end of the hallway and wait him out, practicing a little more with getting the zero shots. Well, to be fair, now that we've gotten a hand on how to use this thing, I don't think the game is as scary anymore as when I played it all those years ago. It's actually pretty easy, Jesus Christ! Okay, I take back everything that I said. This game still scares the ever-living crap out of me. Anyway, we'll make our way back to the kimono room where we encountered Ogata the first time and open a drawer where we'll find a picture and a key. In the picture we'll see Ogata and Miku will notice that there are ropes around his neck. Ogata will appear before us again and we'll be forced into combat with him once more. It's noticeable that with every instance we face Ogata, he seems to gain a little more health than the last encounter. This time in particular, he's definitely more difficult, as he will side shift around the room a lot during the fight. After we're done fighting Ogata, we'll be rewarded with a spirit stone. This will allow us to use bonus functions on the camera that we'll get into later on. We'll continue to the room where Mafuyu encountered his first aggressive ghost, and we're startled by something running up the stairs. We'll continue after it and use the key we found in the drawer to unlock the door at the top. In various rooms, we'll find scraps of a research paper detailing the rituals passed down by the Himuro family. It doesn't go into details as the rituals mostly come from oral history and are lost to time. Through one of the doors, we can see a library of some sorts, which no doubt will be our next destination. Inside one of the other rooms will find a red tape and a red notebook. The notebook contains Takamine's research that tells us of a folklorist called Munakara, who was looking into the Himuro family's rituals. Apparently, Takamine decided to have Ogata look into it. The red tape will contain some more background info from the Takamine team as they made their way through the mansion themselves. As we continue on, we'll find a woman staring into a mirror. We'll snap a picture of her and she'll leave behind a blue flame that will have the woman telling us that there were rope marks appearing on her body, just like what happened to Ogata. Apparently, these were the thoughts of Tomoe, the other member of Takamine's team. We'll find another part of the red notebook and continue on until Miku thinks she sees Mafuyu. She'll head towards him, but reels back when the shadow changes shape. A face peeks around the corner, and this brings us face to face with our next aggressive ghost, the long-armed man. This guy is annoying as all heck. He moves around from left to right and is definitely a lot harder to get into frame than Ogata. We'll have to try a couple of times, but once we finish him off, we're free to continue, making our way through the hallway until in one room we find a document detailing the so-called strangling ritual. On the 13th day of the 12th month, a maiden who was cut off from the outside world 
for 3,669 days will be torn apart to provide power to the rope. In the same room, we'll encounter Tomoe once again and find another part of the red notebook, detailing that the woman in the white kimono is called Kyrie. Tomoe apparently had a sixth sense for ghostly apparitions, and it's likely that this is what's drawing the ghosts to her. We can assume from her writing that by this time in the research, she was scared to death. As we search through the surrounding rooms, we'll encounter a black notebook, which says that the research team found Ogata's body and that his head, hands, and feet were strangled off. Something strange was also visible on a photo of Ogata as there were marks resembling ropes visible on his appendages. We saw this when we found the photo of him in the room with the red hand mirror. Takamine, the author of the notebook, apparently notes that Tomoe by this time had been acting strange as well, but he figured that it mostly had to do with finding Ogata's body in the way that they did. This is pretty much how the entire game proceeds. We'll move on from room to room, finding more items that'll explain how the story went down when Mafuyu, Takamine, and the rest were in the mansion. Throughout the rest of the game, the feeling of dread grows ever more present. While you do have a possibility to fight off the aggressive ghost with the camera obscura, it doesn't feel like a weapon because it puts you extremely close to the ghosts before it's effective. Not to mention the need to have the ghost dead center in the viewfinder with sometimes less than a second to spare before they attack you really put me on edge and I caught myself holding my breath throughout many encounters with many aggressive ghosts. On top of this, the horror aspect in the game is equal parts jump scare and atmosphere building. The game's pacing is absolutely fantastic when it comes to the intention to scare the player. There are parts where you're expecting something to happen in the game, I think intentionally does not have any ghost appearances. On the other hand, the section where there are jump scares, they are performed fantastically. The ghosts either show up in your peripheral vision or from a distance, and the camera sometimes jumps towards where they are in a close-up shot, like with Ogata and the man with the long arms. You're playing a horror game. And if you're like me, easily wound up by games like these, it gets a scare out of me every time the camera suddenly jumps towards one of the ghosts. It's such an effective use of horror because it plays with you on the most fundamental levels of what horror is supposed to be. Let me explain. Effective horror is built off of a combination of atmosphere, suspense, jump scares, and sound design. Atmospherically, the game nails it in the classic haunted house setting. You truly are alone in a deserted mansion. The lights are dim. You have no idea what is around the next corner. This brings with it a layer of fear. You know in the back of your mind that something could happen, but you're probably going through all sorts of scenarios in your head about what it may be the first time you play through the game. The idea that you're not prepared for what's to come is ever present and on your first playthrough this makes the game atmospherically scary. The suspense building in the game is in the sense that it's not a constant assault on the senses in terms of jump scares. There's a rhythm in the way that developers decided to scare the players in sense of slow builds foreshadowing that something is about to happen but then toying with the player by either extending the slow build longer than it should or have nothing happen at all, only throwing in a jump scare when the player thought they were safe. I thought that no ghost would be able to get to me in the courtyard of the mansion, so letting loose an enemy on me at that time definitely got me scared quite a bit. It's a definite skill that the developers got this right, as overusing jump scares can take you out of your scared mindset. It desensitizes you since you know it's going to happen anyway. It's the main reason why the game, in my opinion, is a bit less scary the second time you play through it. The combat events are mostly scripted, so you know what's coming. But that first time? Oh boy. Finally, there's sound design. It's essential to creating the overall atmosphere we touched upon before. The soundtrack keeps you on edge, and jump scares are heightened by switching the sounds from a wailing background to a quick burst of sound, as if to force you to be alert. If you don't expect it coming, this quick soundbite will 
force you to pay attention, making you stop in your place to check if your surroundings are safe. The game is divided into nights. Night 1 is the part where we start off playing as Miku and generally has us dealing with getting our bearings of Himuro Mansion and learning about the strangling ritual. Throughout the other nights we learn of more rituals such as the blinding ritual and the demon tag ritual, each with their own horrifying conclusions drawing us ever closer to what actually happened on a fateful day years ago and why this cursed place finds itself in the state it's in. It turns out that Himuro Mansion was built on top of a hell gate, which is an apparent gateway to the land of the dead. The strangling ritual along with the blinding ritual and presumably several other smaller rituals are used to keep the hell gate closed. These rituals needed to be performed by the Himuro family every 10 years and required the sacrifice of a young maiden. If the rituals failed, the Hellgate would open and unleash a force called Malice into the world. Throughout the game, we learn of an event called the Calamity that happened in 1837. During this, apparently something went wrong with the latest in line of rituals meant to keep the Hellgate closed. We do eventually learn of the cause of the Calamity, Kyrie. Kyrie was chosen to be the Rope Shrine Maiden in order to keep the Hellgate from opening and at the young age of seven was selected through a series of trials and locked away for ten years until the time of the strangling ritual arrived. Nearing the time of the strangling ritual, Kyrie met and fell in love with a visitor to the mansion, meeting him on occasion. The Himuro family master thought that this was dangerous as Kyrie formed an attachment to the man and ordered for him to be disposed of. Kyrie learns of her loved one's fate and is haunted by guilt, believing that she caused his death. Finally, the day of the ritual arrives and Kyrie is taken to the moon well to be purified before the ritual. She's then escorted by Lord Himuro and the four head priests to the underground rope altar where the ritual would take place. She's laid down onto the central stone and ropes were tied around her neck and limbs, the ropes connected to five wheels and turned by the four priests and Lord Himuro himself. The wheels were turned until she was strangled and her limbs were torn from her body. The blood-soaked ropes, which are now sanctified by her blood, were taken to the Hellgate and used to seal it for years, until the next time the ritual needed to be done. But in order to complete the ritual properly, the maiden must have severed her attachments to the living world. This is the reason why she is normally secluded from the rest until she's needed. Having fallen in love and learning of her loved one's fate, Kyrie was tainted with guilt, and the ritual turned out to be a failure. In response to the failed ritual, the Hellgate burst open and the malice that was inside was released all over the mansion. The malice killed most of the people inside and drove others mad, covering the mansion and the surrounding areas in darkness. Kyrie's spirit wasn't spared, and she was also corrupted by the malice, turning her into a vengeful ghost bent on making others feel the pain that she endured. Luckily for the world, five holy mirrors placed around shrines in the area kept the malice from spreading further than the area surrounding Himuro Mansion. As long as nothing happened to them, the world would at least be somewhat safe. So, of course, due to an earthquake happening, the mirrors are broken, letting the malice spread beyond the containment area and endangering the world. Because of course it does. We can't have happy endings. However, in a twist of fate, Kyrie's sense of duty at being the maiden split her spirit in two. One half became the hostile ghost that killed all who entered the mansion, and the other half took the form of Kyrie as a child the girl in the white kimono that we've seen throughout our adventure in the mansion. Kyrie's child form means to help us on our way, pointing us in the right direction as we make our way on our adventure. During our search throughout Himuro Mansion, we learn of the True Holy Mirror, an additional object that protected the world against the Hellgate opening. Because of the failed ritual, the mirror shattered, and pieces of it were scattered throughout Himuro Mansion and the surrounding areas. 
One by one, we manage to get hold of the pieces of the remains of the mirror until we reach the final battle against Kyrie. When we snap the last picture of her, the camera obscura is destroyed. We're left with nothing to defend ourselves against Kyrie until the girl in the white kimono shows up and points out that the last part of the holy mirror was inside of the camera all along. We pick up the last piece of the true holy mirror and place it on the rock opposite to the door containing the room with the Hellgate door. When Kyrie looks into the mirror, it cleanses the malice from her and makes her appear along with Mafuyu. The siblings don't have a lot of time to enjoy being together again, as Kyrie mentions that her job as the rope shrine maiden isn't over yet. The three head into the final room, and Kyrie places herself in front of the door of the Hellgate, holding it in place. A rumbling begins, and Miku wants Mafuyu and her to leave the mansion. However, Mafuyu decides he wants to stay with Kyrie, keep her company as during the course of the game he's developed feelings for her. You know, murdering ghosts just have that effect on the guy. Eventually, Miku leaves Himuro Mansion without her brother. She looks up as the spirits of all the souls trapped in the mansion itself finally are let go and they can continue into the afterlife, finding their peace after years of being caught in the dark grip of malice. She looks at the mansion one last time, telling us that ever since that moment, she's no longer able to see the things that others can't. She's effectively lost her sixth sense. It's important to note that this is the canonical ending to Fatal Frame. There is the possibility to unlock the alternate ending, but not a lot changes besides Mafuyu escaping Himuro Manor along with Miku and both of them losing their sixth sense. And with that, the adventure in Himuro Mansion is finally over. And that's the story for Fatal Frame. Revisiting this game after all these years brought back a lot of memories for me. I used to play this game on a small CRT in my room in the dead of night, and even though I was scared at times, it definitely left a good impression. The story is deeper than I initially thought, and the ending is bittersweet to say the least. There's no real happy ending for Kyrie, and in the canonical ending, Miku doesn't receive a happy ending either, having to watch her brother give up his life just so he can provide comfort to Kyrie as she continues her purpose as the Rope Shrine Maiden. There are a couple of things that I can applaud about the game that make it stand out from other games in the same genre. The atmosphere building, like I said before, is sublime. It really builds upon trying to bring forth a fear in the player, putting us on edge. Even though the world itself, the classic haunted mansion setting, lends itself incredibly for a classic ghost story, I feel a lot of the tension building also comes from having Miku as the main character. Miku is not your standard damsel in distress, and that's all for the better. She's someone who is technically way in over her head in the situation in Himuro Mansion. The good thing about her, in my opinion, is that Miku is scared. See, let's take Miku out of Fatal Frame for a second, and compare her to the protagonist from Resident Evil, for example. Protagonists in those games like Leon are visibly shaken by the events happening in the early stages of the game, but it always feels like their fear makes way for a drive to complete their mission pretty quick. I'm sure it helps that they are armed or have training and they are facing physical enemies like zombies who generally have known weaknesses, but the fact that Miku doesn't grow out of her fear during the course of the game, but instead pushes through Himuro Mansion to find her brother despite of it, makes her an effective character to substitute the feelings of the player. Whenever a cutscene plays and we see Miku being afraid, it has its effects on us as well. Our character never grows out of her scared reactions, which makes perfect sense, seeing as she's a 17-year-old girl who has nothing more than a camera to protect her. The game is not without its flaws though. In my opinion, the voice acting isn't the greatest. The voice acting for Mafuyu in the beginning of the game sounds like he's literally just reading from the script. It's not a big flaw, and not everyone may agree, but it's something I noticed a few times when I played through the game multiple times to capture footage. In the game's defense, in the sense of world building and overall atmosphere, 
it takes a definite win in my book. Initially, the game was marketed as being based on a true story. Heck, it literally shows it on the menu screen. Inherently, it's not true. As far as I could find, the events in Himuro Mansion did not actually happen. At least I think humanity would be well aware if there was a Hellgate situated under a mansion in Japan. Instead, the stories the game uses as its basis are several Japanese folklore legends which have been adjusted to fit into the narrative of the game. I imagine it's a bit of marketing strategy from the producer company, but it was the early 2000s. I'm sure we can overlook that. All in all, I feel that Fatal Frame is a fantastic game for the time it came out. It did something very different in a genre that is generally dominated by Resident Evil and managed to pull it off very well. While the game would never see the overall success that Resi experienced, it would gain quite a steady following from its fans. And to be fair, the sequels are very enjoyable for people that like the first game. In my opinion, the game is a very good addition to the horror survival genre, and I hope they continue the series further. The fifth part, Maiden of Blackwater, was re-released a little more than a year ago, and is another fantastic game to enjoy either on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox. And that's all I have to say about Fatal Frame. Maybe you agree with my thoughts, and maybe you don't. I'd love to know what you think on the matter, so if you'd like, leave a comment and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you like the videos, please consider subscribing to the channel. You don't have to, but I would absolutely appreciate it if you did. As for now, I'll see you on the next video, champ. Take care.